Okay, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Alex Pelzer. I'm also part of the NFCO team and I'm going to talk a bit about uh, migrating legacy workflows to Nextflow. Uh, legacy as in old legacy workflows being built with previous technologies and tools and languages basically. So in this case I'm talking about uh, maybe not that old code actually, but um, kind of old code in terms of having some bash scripts, Java, tools, some Python scripts or something like that. This uh, is uh, kind of the next 15-20 uh, minutes of content hopefully. So legacy code, uh, I just briefly wanted to define a bit because there are some definitions out there. So some people define it a bit differently. In this case I want to make clear what I mean with legacy in this context is that I refer to it as being inherited code or a code that has been around, for example, in a research institute being actively used for a couple of years to do some analysis question, uh, to do some analysis for particular research question, for example. And these, these types of workflows or let's say just bash scripts or Python scripts are typically kept within research institutes for quite a while. Some PhD students started it, maybe even a master student started it, then you got somebody with a PhD student status working on it and this kind of develops an evolutionary uh, self-sustaining thing and in the end you end up with having a really big big pile of code that is really difficult to maintain, really difficult to extend, really difficult to understand because you're actually lost after a couple of years. Some people are leaving as well. You don't know anything about it anymore. It's really diff difficult to work with and it also has some, potentially it also inherits some bugs and problems that you have to fix in the future. So it doesn't mean necessarily that such legacy code is really a bad thing. It can be bad code, but it doesn't have to be. In some cases I've seen workflows and tools and some bash scripts that are do doing one particular thing in a very proper way. So it doesn't have to be really bad stuff. Don't take me wrong on that. And in many cases it's also the case that you have lots of experience in this kind of old code because people are having had to work around certain issues, problems in the past already, found workarounds for that, for example, which are not part of this piece of code. If you just start from scratch, for example, and have to do the same thing, you might actually hit exactly the same issues because sometimes these are not fixed, for example. And information such as how do I do X in tool Y is typically part of these kind of legacy code, which, is, which inherently doesn't make it a bad thing to actually use that code. Um, so in all, uh, all in all, um, this is kind of the way I would define legacy code in this context that I wanted to talk about today with you here. And what do I want to do with porting such legacy code to Nextflow, for example, or some modern, let's say, uh, workflow description language? The basic question I ask myself always is, is it worth the effort? So that was my intention, uh, my, uh, my first question I had back a couple of years ago when I started using Nextflow, adopting it. The first question I asked myself, is it worth the extra learning effort? Do I have to take the, the time to actually invest to learn Nextflow now properly and then to move on porting my old code bases, my old workflow code, some bash code for example, to Nextflow? Is it worth the effort? What do I get from that? Typically what I would say is the cool thing is if you have already a legacy code, you already have this kind of experience from your old pipeline development, let's say, in this code basis. And if you extract that part and move it to some modern framework, you actually gain a lot. The first thing you gain, you, exp you can actually extract the experience. The next thing that you can actually also try to make up here is um, you can try to keep old features inside that might be really of interest for researchers, for example. But you can also, if you migrate to a modern framework, take advantage of modern computing resources. So for example, I worked uh, on some old bash scripts that were tailed, tailored for a system in a research institute in Tübingen in Germany. But when my former boss moved to Jena, we were unable to run that anymore because they had a new system there, <coughs> which was incompatible in the way that we used the workflow. So stuff like this, portability in this sense, basically, and reproducibility, that's what you typically are concerned of nowadays and might be, weren't that concerned like five or 10 years ago. The cool thing is also if you are investing the time and the effort to migrate your old code to something like Nextflow as a framework, uh, NFCore for example, you get the community uh, basically for free. 
you get a lot of people interested because you have active com communities behind that. And instead, if you just have your own internal in-house Python script, for example, Java tool, you might actually not have a community around it because people don't really care. They might have to use your stuff, but not necessarily um, they are actually engaging actively with what you're doing. Yes. The cool thing is also that NextFlow with the community around it makes it very easy for users to also start developing on top of what you are doing because the kind of general framework is the same for everybody else. And you can benefit from t stuff like AWS Batch or cloud computing in general. You can use containers. Stuff like this was really tricky to do if you just have a set of Bash scripts. So with all that in mind, uh, I just wanted to briefly start with uh, my experiences I had when I migrated one of my uh, more kind of more commonly used workflows to NFCore and uh, therefore Nextflow as well. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about now in a couple of minutes. The first thing I wanted to stress with this is that you should always take the time to look at old code. With taking the time to look at the old code, I mean, you should actually invest some time analyzing what your old code did. Not just taking that code, taking the bits and pieces out of it that you think are interesting and just moving that to new Nextflow code because that won't really work. It will work in a sense that you can actually migrate most of it, but it will make your overall development experience really cumbersome, let's say. At least what I would recommend everybody doing something like this, migrating old code, is that you do a minimal system analysis. So what is the purpose of the software? What do, does it really do? What does it have to do, basically? And do I need to port everything? So for example, the pipeline I, I, I will show you now in a couple of minutes um, was an ancient DNA pipeline. And this pipeline had some components which are now heavily seen as outdated. So people wouldn't use that anymore. So I just dropped these components because I don't think it's even worth the effort to port that because people are not using it actively. And as well, if you're porting stuff like this, are there parts that are rarely used? You could also have some kind of a priority list, which is the more important parts to port and then go from top to down. Do it that way. That makes it really much less painful for you to port the code. Don't just start. Just don't do that. Just invest that minimum time in the beginning to analyze what you want to do and then proceed from there. So I'm talking about this fancy little pipeline which was started as part of my master's thesis actually and then I did my entire PhD on this. Uh, in 2016 it got uh, published in genome biology. It's basically a Java and Java Swing uh, pipeline. So the, the Java part is a command line client that just consumes an XML file with some parameters, for example, and then executes that on your cluster or workstation using, for example, Docker. Uh, the entire pipeline was available thanks to Christian, who's also here today, uh, was available as a Docker image, including that Java code, and then you could run that on any cluster infrastructure that we were getting our hands on back then. That was already quite fancy, but it was also cumbersome because I had to actually maintain two components. I had to maintain the command line client and I had to maintain a graphical user interface that creates my config files, basically. So that was kind of cumbersome. The co command line component was basically that of what you're actually now using as Nextflow. So what, what the command line component was doing, running a process executor and then executing whatever tool it needed to call. So I basically wrote my own executor, which I would never do again, because it's pain. It's really pain, and it takes you ages to actually get that right. So Nextflow does that for you, for example, nowadays. This is the graphic user interface. Lovely for users, lovely for PhD students and other uh, biologists, let's say. But it's hard for me as a developer, because every time somebody has found a bug, I have to redo the entire graphical interface, I have to replace components, and I'm not, so as you can see, I'm not a graphic user interface designer. I don't like it. <laughs> and you can see that when you look at this. It's not completely cluttered, but it's not really intuitive either. So I wouldn't actually do that again. It's quite inflexible because if you want to have new components, if you want to add something to your pipeline, you have to do that from scratch. You have to add that in the graphic user interface and various locations, it's really hard to maintain. Yeah. So what I did is basically looking at the code that I had in my Java 
uh, pipeline, uh, which was already quite abstract code. So I had an abstract class called a module, basically, that contained then uh, subclasses um, that inherited code from that module class and just contained snippets calling, uh, for example, fastqc, bwa, or whatever tool I had in my pipeline and executing these on a cluster using process executor using the CLI component. What I did there is basically, so what, what that was actually, in, in terms of design, this was actually not that bad because it also helped me later when I had to port that to Nextflow because the only thing I had to look at was these individual modules, taking the code snippets out there and moving that to Nextflow scripts, to Nextflow processes. That was kind of easy. But if you have bash scripts, for example, it won't be that easy, unfortunately. In many cases, you have hidden stuff in there, renaming stuff in there, variables that are not accessible that easily. And then you end up having to actually look up much more than just single scripts. <coughs> what in, subsequently, what broke my neck with this project was the maintenance, mainly. I was the sole developer of that thing. We had two or three people who were kind of developers, kind of submitting at least bug reports with more details so I could actually dig into it deeper. And that's really tricky because if you have something like that happening during your PhD or even if you're not just doing your PhD but you're working in a research institute, you have to invest a lot of your time in the maintenance of such a work, uh, workflow uh, that's blocking like 70-80% of your entire time even on weekends. So I wouldn't advise to do that with like Java or Bash script now anymore. Because especially the parts to submit jobs to a cluster, for example, to submit jobs to a workstation, this is the, the part that consumed most of my work actually back then. So, and I wasn't even able to co come up with solutions for stuff like that was coming up like Conda, containers, schedulers, new HPC systems, cloud computing. That kind of stuff wasn't even possible for me to reach with my old pipeline. So that kind of information, uh, that kind of stuff, that's why you should actually consider moving your stuff to Nextflow. So what I did uh, initially, fan, uh, there was, Fortunately, already the NF core create command available back then when I started porting that old pipeline to a next flow. So what I did is I used the NF core create command to initialize a pipeline skeleton that I then tried to fill with the code snippets I took out of my old pipeline, basically. So I took the Java code, I took these modules that I just showed quickly, I took all the code snippets out there, pushed them over to uh, this pipeline skeleton. The cool thing about that is that's cool in terms of that you can do the command line part, but the graphical user interface is currently not possible. But as Phil, for example, just said in his talk, we are working on a JSON scheme for all the parameters, which will then hopefully be possible, make it possible to have uh, automatically created graphical user interface that adopts to whatever you have in terms of parameters in your pipeline, which will automatically create you a graphical user interface without the need for me to do the maintenance for that graphical user interface, because I just do maintain basically this JSON scheme and that's it. So I won't do an, a graphical user interface anymore, for example, for that pipeline. So what the old code looked like is, so this was basically the set parameters method in that old Java code. It's all on GitHub, you can have a look at my first uh, attempts on Java. <laughs> And what this did basically was creating uh, two default parameters, one default and one after merging fastqc call. And then it submitted basically this here. Yeah, this here as a command to whatever system you had when you ran that pipeline. It's not the worst thing I have to say. Still after a couple of years, I have to say it's, it's not looking that bad to read it. But the problem with that is uh, the, the background code behind all of this, that's the part where it gets messy and really ugly. Whereas if you port the same piece of information to Nextflow, I left out the data staging and input output description here, but the actual script, that's just this. You don't have to think about the data staging anymore. You don't have to maintain the code to do that. You don't have to think where to run your code because it's all encapsulated, abstracted away by the Nextflow framework. There's no complex switch, switch statements. It's really easy to do that. And I could basically drop like half of the code snippets I had. I could drop significant parts of it because that is just not necessary anymore. 
which is lovely. So what I did is dropping from my module set, set of med modules I had, I dropped a couple of these completely, entirely, because I didn't need them anymore, because that's stuff that is now automatically done by Nextflow. I deleted some of the outdated methods that I don't want to half in my pipeline anymore. And then I extracted code snippets of all of these individual Java classes and migrated them over to Nextflow. First step I did for that, I condified everything. So my own tools that are part of this, which are other some small Java or Python tools, I condified all of them, put them to Bioconda and ConduForge. So to be able to actually have a nice little environment YAML file to have the environment for my pipeline in a proper shape. For tools I wrote myself, I added multi-QC support so that they output JSON files now with the matrices that I need for um, uh, doing some fancy reporting in the end. And then I put all of this in a single environment in a single container, which also makes it much easier to port the entire pipeline because back then I had to from hand basically create a Docker container with all the tools I needed inside uh, for the pipeline dependency graph. So this manual installation list, please install this all manually, is now just an environment YAML file with Bioconda and Conda Forge links basically. And you can recreate and update that quite frequently, which it, it's like 10 times easier, just to be honest about it. So I just had people coming from different institutes now asking, okay, how do I install that pipe? And yeah, you don't install it, you just type next flow run and it pulls everything that you need, that's it. Stuff like that, I had, I don't know, I can't recall how many Skype sessions I had helping people setting up my former pipeline at their institute. It's a mess, just to say that. And it, I think it's just one case, but it's the case in many, yeah, for many other workflows as well. What do you get? Well, as I said, you get a community. Back then it was just me. Now there's at least a couple of other people contributing. Some of them are not contributing a lot. Some of them are contributing indirectly. So, but still, you have some people actually, actually, actually actively contributing stuff to your pipeline, at least improving or opening bug reports, issues on GitHub. You get some interaction, which is lovely. What do you also get? Documentation is much easier because you now have the time to actually invest some effort into documentation. So for example, I have somebody sitting in Uppsala. Uh, we never met in person, but she used the pipeline for a couple of her research projects, asked questions about how to interpret the output results, and then started drawing. So these are hand-drawn um, uh, figures um, that she made for the documentation of the pipeline, opening pull requests for my documentation. So I now have figures like this in the documentation of the pipeline. Stuff like that never happened with the old approach I used because people are having also now the time to use the pipeline on their own infrastructure without a lot of hassle and now investing time to give back at least some documentation, information, okay, yeah, this part is logical, I don't understand that part, please help me with that and then you can improve upon everything much easier than it was before because nobody understood what I'm doing in that Java uh, chunk of code. Um, yeah, NF core logo doesn't load, which is weird. The cool thing about it, as I briefly mentioned it already, is also that you can run it everywhere now. So the pipeline, I developed that on a workstation in our institute. Uh, I migrated everything there, tried it out there, migrated everything to Nextflow and NF core. And now I can run it at the institute I formerly worked in, in Jena, in Eastern Germany. I can run it on the BINA cluster, which is a bioinformatics cluster that we heavily use at the institute I'm working. But I can also run the, work, uh, the same workflow on Amazon, for example. So we've had people now on the Australian Center of Ancient DNA, they're using this now on Amazon Web Services because they don't have any HPC on premises anymore. So they use that now on Am Amazon directly without actually changing anything in the code, which is lovely. What do you also get if you migrate your code? Yeah, you could reproduce whatever you did a couple of months ago, a couple of years ago, hopefully. Back with my old approach, it wasn't possible to do that, it, or at least it was really horrible to do that. Back then I had to always resolve broken dependencies because somebody upgraded a module on a cluster which broke like three of my tools. 
and then you have to dig into that deeper and fix these uh, broken dependencies. Nowadays, you just specify with the Nextflow feature actually this um, this uh, minus R switch there. Uh, 2.0.7 means you just download the image for 2.0.7 and run exactly the same workflow again, which is something making your life easier. What you also get is automated tests. My former pipeline was tested. I had a nice little small test framework that was executed, but it was executed manually. There was no such thing as continuous integration because my former boss didn't pay for it. I was a, it was impossible to run the, the test suite I had on Travis or Circle CI or something like that. Some of the services didn't exist back then, but still it was not possible to do that. With the next ported stuff, it's really terribly easy to actually run continuous integration on anything you write. And we do that heavily in NF Core and recently also started picking up on GitHub Actions to do that, which it makes it even easier than before, in my opinion. You can run basically arbitrarily uh, complex uh, dependencies and just run a set of parameters against uh, other sets of parameters and basically find even edge cases for your pipeline that might not work very easily. If you want to do that some, with something like I had before, like the Java framework I used before, that's really tough to do. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's tough to do. Yeah, that's one of the cases I just showed. So you have 32 successful checks, 32 of combi parameter combinations automatically running on GitHub Actions in this case. Uh, passing so you know exactly okay these parts with my test data they work I can actually I can guarantee that this works for at least the test data I have. Um, some things I found while doing this um, the first thing I would also recommend everybody is please start small and then reiterate and add stuff continuously after doing tests. So if you start with a simple skeleton code from NFCore Create, you can add a couple of modules on top of that, add some dependencies in the beginning. I would also advise you to work on the dependencies first, get everything that you need in Conda or Bioconda, build your Docker singularity container first, and then proceed from there. If you do it the other way around, you're sometimes screwing up and you don't know what's happening. That's just something I had to learn the hard way. Uh, always do a minimum working example first. So like take a small test data set in the beginning and do that as a very first start. Also for development, it helps you a lot. If you have something like a test profile, which we encourage people to do in NFCore, for example, to link to test data publicly available, that makes it much easier also during development. Tests first, development later. That's the way to go. It helps you a, a lot. And follow community guidelines. There's a couple of out there, uh, not just the NFCore ones, I, this is a link to the NFCore uh, ones, but there are also community guidelines on how to do best practice in software development. Read them. They help, actually. And it's never too late. So I started that pipeline in 2012. I started my PhD in 2013, published it in 2016, but the migration happened in 2017, 2018. So it's never too late. That could be even older code you could port to Nextflow and NFCore if you want to. And it's really worth the effort. I would still redo that. Thank you all for watching. Questions? I don't know, what's the Wi-Fi actually? Special accelerator at PGA. Am I out of luck there, or is this, are there no limits with Nextflow porting? Uh, I recently saw that there are some changes in the Nextflow code basis. I think there is now a scope for accelerators coming, right? Yes. Am I right? At the moment, I think that's just a rename of the former GPU support in Nextflow, but uh, with the potential that there could be stuff added like the um, TPM modules, for example. No, how do you call it? Accelerator. Accelerators. Um, or, there's uh, this. Amazon only support GPU. So yes. The idea, my understanding is that, is that they are going to support more GPU, more accelerator types. Yeah. Like the machine learning accelerators, for example, that are now, I think they're not a, 
I'm not sure who's actually offering them as well, but these, for example, could also be supported at some point. And then you could use that as well in Nextflow code. Support for that, for example, was also something. I mean, there's at least two tools in the ancient DNA pipeline I wrote, uh, which could benefit largely from GPUs, for example, and supporting that with my old Java framework would also, I wouldn't know where to start, actually. It's really difficult. More questions? Okay, thanks.